thinking. What I would like to talk about is, I would like to start with what is social design. And uh, first of all, I would like to kind of give you the structure of what I will cover. Designing social design would be inclusive design, sustainable design, and design for the developing world. So, if you can see on the slide there, I will start with William Morris and the arts and crafts movement, would be what are notions of social design today. So, I, I mentioned that for most of you, if you're doing a, an MA in social design, you, you must have your own ideas and notions of what uh, social design is. And the first thing I put on there, it's a better design for the greater good. Which basically means, it's kind of a very, very short definition of social design. And at the same time, social design is loosely referred to as a design process that contributes to improving the overall human well-being and livelihood. Now, what, what, what do we mean by this, the kind of a improving the, the overall human well-being and livelihood? So social design is, is pretty much concerned with improving human life, not just about human life, but also how we, do, we interact with each other and the environment. The reason why I would like to start with William Morris and the Industrial Revolution and the Arts and Crafts Movement is most of you will know, um, most of you, if you have studied design, you must have come across uh, the Arts and Crafts Movement, which is pretty much where most historians or design historians see as the starting point of modern industrial design. And, 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 why, do we, and why do I call the Arts and Crafts Movement the, one of the first forms of social design? And William Morris was very much inspired by the writings of John Ruskin. And if you look at this image um, in Manchester during the 19th century in North Bigdon, you can understand just, just about why he was so concerned with the environment and the welfare of the worker. With industrialization, mainly in Europe in the 19th century and in Britain, working conditions were quite appalling and not just the working conditions, but also the kind of uh, pollution eminent in most European cities at the time, especially in, in England and also later in Germany and parts of Central Europe. Behind Papanek. So, again, Papanek was reacting against this notion of, uh, and again, please remember that by the 60s, Europe was uh, post-war and was the first generation living in, in a kind of a prosperity. Europe was becoming richer and richer and the West, well, the Western world, not just Europe, but Japan and America, they were becoming richer and richer and more developed in terms of technologically. Now, so Papanek claimed, I, I will just read the slide so if you kind of could follow me. Uh, Papanek claimed that the philosophy of most industrial designers were based on five myths. The myth that all products are mass produced, the myth of obsolence, the myth of people's wants, the myth of designers' lack of control, and the myth that quality no longer counts. Papanek's manifesto for reform in design philosophy was based on his rejection of these myths. Now, and how does this relate to Papanek and his ideals? Now, during his seminar, Papanek, having identified his five myths, then Papanek went on to kind of uh, propose the tools for designers to counteract those five myths that he saw as being unproductive and part of the capitalism system that would not create notions of social design. Now, and the kind of uh, alternatives that Papanek envisioned was pretty much designed for undeveloped, emergent and backward regions of the world. 
The second one was design of teaching and training devices for the retarded, the handicapped, the disabled and the disadvantaged. Kind of a guide de port, a kind of organic society, organic cities where nothing would be planned under a master urban plan that we have in most western cities, you know, most European cities they have to follow street kind of a urban planning regulations. And what they what they were going on was about a new kind of a organic urban reality. Let it grow organically, let it evolve according to the wishes and the needs of the population and the people. Now when when over fifty percent of the population suddenly becomes disabled. I'm not saying that every old person is disabled, but all of us will suffer from one sort of one kind of visibility or the other. Then it is important that we start addressing those issues. And in Europe and well any developed country from in Japan as well, that's already being looked after by law. You can't build any public building that's not accessible. And that's true in any European country or in any developed country. In fact, in America it's exactly the same thing. And so so it is in Japan as well. So now the other major issue that's facing social design today is the environment to so, be sustainable. Utopian or not, can we really say that oh it's wonderful to think about ideals of social design? to go about and create a better society. You know, you as designers, you have, your role is to think about how to create a new world where everybody is happy, where you protect the environment, and you look for and you address real needs. But is this utopian? Can we really actually do this? Uh, so the question here was, um, uh, to what extent actually all these notions uh, would um, fold into uh, projecting the future into ways of understanding or re-understanding the notion of technology. For instance, you mentioned Archigram, the walking city. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that the way forward if we uh, look for uh, social design? How, how does the notion of technology and social design fold onto each other in your opinion? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm, a, you know, um, I'm not a designer, I do uh, design theory. And I can give you a kind of a, the current thinking, you have three, three major issues happening at the, at the moment. For well, some of the people who are hardcore technologists, you know, the scientists, some of them they think that, I'll talk about the environment for instance, some of them they say that we shouldn't really worry too much about the environment or protecting the environment because at the pace that technology is evolving, we will soon create a technological solution for the environment. Now, that's, that's kind of a very positive and kind of very forward-thinking way. That's kind of, and again, it relates back to the modernists and to Carnap, to Rudolf Carnap, this idea of technology and science as the answer to everything. And others, they, like the, the, the people who, who follow permaculture, they say, oh no, that's impossible. We should really never look at technology as the answer to everything. We really should cut cut down on on consumption, cut down on and the movement is very radical. You know, if you follow permaculture they they want to totally abolish the way society lives today and go back to living in small farms. So uh, me personally I think there's a balance. Uh, I think it, Going back to something like permaculture, which would imply living as people used to live in back in the ninth, ninth century, might be a bit too radical. But to rely too much on technology as the answer to our future problems is also a bit uh, utopian, I think. So there's a balance between the two, I think. What kind of groups of people are there around the world that actually are putting in practice their ideal world, or trying to build their ideal community or something like that. And then, yeah, then you come across the election problem, and then the only guy with actually a real kind of vision is a bit short, uh, yeah, it's a bit short-minded somehow, or a really narrow-minded. 
Although, um, so then you start asking, so why is this, and what, why is this not here, or what can, what can actually become, become this new vision? Is that then I started to think, well, so what are the kind of ideals that we strive for today, and what is being taught in 1516, and is there really so much difference than what we strive for today, as was actually being described in this book? I mean, even already then he talks, for example, about euthanasia and things like that, that are still like some kind of tricky uh, topics for uh, today's uh, politics. And so this is very fascinating because when, so if this ideal that's already there like for 400 years or something uh, is still kind of the standard, of course things have changed and it's a bit less, uh, it's a bit more social, uh, socialist oriented this book and all this stuff, but in essence there are still uh, the same lines in, in the kind of ideals that our governments are moving forward to us. So, how can, what is, is the, can there be a new ideal in the first place? I mean, you know already said it, like, so what has changed? Like, are there really that many changes? And, but how, how can this be done? And I think also in this presentation, I don't have, I don't have an answer to something, but I think it's mainly about raising questions and actually starting to, to keep trying, I mean, that's what I think all these examples are also showing. It's about trying, uh, believing in something, although you know no how, so you do it in your own way and see. It's a pretty basic system, but in all fairness, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, um, cube, and we made it because it had six sides. And then one side is, uh, has a slot, so you can put your own ideas also in the ideology, so um, we don't want to be dictators or anything, so uh, everything's welcome and then we can... Okay, so you conflict to start communication. Share everything, it's based on rental services. But here you have the actual uh, right. system for uh, rent, like you have the rental company and uh, around you have the users, and the users go to the rental company. We saw this in the beautiful animals and <laughs> achieve what they want to be, or some organization that tells us what to do. So, and uh, uh, the aim is to uh, provide the forbidden action to educate. It was um, sharing knowledge uh, and skills. With your own skills, and you can also see the other things that people are teaching or lecturing or showing you.